Hi. Thank you for being here, and thank you for being here. If you have watched one of those adorable kitten videos with the cat riding around on the robotic vacuum cleaner, you can thank Professor Rodney Brooks. Sorry about that. Yeah. He was the founder and CTO of iRobot, which makes the Roomba the first robot we've really invited into our homes. And you are currently the founder and CTO of Rethink Robotics, which is building cobots. These are robots that are working alongside people in complex manufacturing environments. I'm curious to know what was the first or the biggest tech breakthrough that got us here in robotics in general, or the current robot? With your robots, Baxter and Sawyer, what oh, made the that robots. Yeah, possible? Absolutely, it's that we have force sensing in every joint, so we can measure forces. Um, in joint coordinates, but then you can convert that to real coordinates. So when our robot is moving, it's got a forward model of what force it should feel everywhere. If someone's in the way, it can react immediately and not kill you. This is important uh, because existing industrial robots are unaware of their surroundings. They will just ramp up the, the, uh, the uh, current to keep moving if there's anything in the way. Your robots have human names. Baxter yes. and Sawyer, they have eyes, um, a, a face they that's have, very friendly. They have, they have cameras and they have fake eyes. I don't know whether, if, if that picture was up on the screen, that would be great. I don't know if it's possible to get up there. They, uh, the screen has um, graphic eyes and the robots glance where they're about to reach, which is what people do. So if you're around someone, you're not surprised by, you know, I'm not going to suddenly reach over like this. I'm going to look before I reach. The robot does the same, and then people uh, are aware of what it's about to do, so it doesn't surprise them. And, and the arms are sort of have a human feeling to them too. Because, is, because of the force sensitivity, yes. Is biomimicry the way to go for greater safety and dexterity? Um, when we're putting robots in environments where people normally are, some level of biomimicry is important. You know, the biggest. I think the big problem for home robots is right now they're Roombas, they're low to the ground, and um, our homes are designed for something that's you know between five and six feet tall uh, and skinny to move around in. And uh, so I think that's where we'll ultimately see home robots being tall and skinny because the environment is designed for tall and skinny. Any humanoid or? I don't know. You know, um, the Roomba is definitely not humanoid but people project a lot onto it. The robots we had, we had 6,500 robots in Afghanistan and Iraq doing roadside bombs. Didn't look humanoid at all, but people named them and said they were their friends. Um, Roombas, you can, buy, uh, you can buy clothes for your Roombas. There's multiple companies that sell clothes for people's Roombas. So, so people project a lot onto, the, onto these robots, even though they're not of human form. Uh, Industrial robots that we build now are of human form. Bezos Expeditions is an investor in Rethink. Is Amazon a customer? Amazon has some, but they're not a big customer, no. no. And Amazon has also invested a lot into their own internal robotics. They bought, they bought Kiva Systems, which was a startup in Boston, um, which uh, for fulfillment centers, instead of having the people go and pick stuff off the shelves, the Kiva systems, the robots bring the shelves to the, put to the human picker who does the picking. They, they bought them for $775 million when Kiva was about 100 employees. Amazon Robotics, which is what they became, has at least 600 employees in, in the Boston area and probably more elsewhere that I don't know about. So they've they right. made a big, big investment. I didn't know the exact head count there, but I know it's a significant investment in the people and the IP. Do you worry they could become a competitor? Well, we're, we're, we're operating in, we're not doing fulfillment per se, we're doing third party logistics where you unpack stuff and repack stuff, but we're doing a lot of stuff in electronics assembly um, and uh, a lot of machine tending, putting stuff into machines, uh, sliding the door shut, because normally a human has an interlock, pressing the button and waiting for it to come out. Uh, so that's very different from what they're doing. They're, they're, they're mobile bases. You, and you don't think they'd have a need to develop their own robot like that? Sorry? You don't think they'd have a need to develop their own robots like that? They do have the Echo. Given, 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 given everything that keeps coming out of Amazon, I would never make a prediction that they're not doing something. Um, I don't know.
But you don't worry you would be competitive with one of your investors' companies in that sense? Well, Jeff is a personal investor. Amazon is not an investor in, in this company. I'm curious, um, getting back to the idea that uh, homes really need like taller, skinnier robots, what techno technical advances do we still need before we have commander data or Rosie from Jetsons, some, you know, a robot that really feels like a companion and that we would trust in our homes around our kids and dogs? I trust my Roomba. Um, okay, yes, in addition to the Roomba. Yeah, um, I, I think what we're going to see over the next 30 years, we're not going to see commander data, sorry, it's going to be a long way up, but we're going to see robots that um, can get up and down stairs because uh, uh, in the house, and by the way, everyone's, apart from the flying drones to deliver packages, anyone else who's delivering packages with some automated systems, most houses, even in the suburbs, have a few steps up so that robots are going to have to deal with steps, which I think is probably going to get towards electric legs, um, but maybe not two legs, maybe four legs. Um, and we see a few different robots like that. Certainly, uh, Boston Dynamics, which is owned by Google, has now got, I think they call it Spot, is it? The four-legged electric robot. Um, Sung Bae Kim at uh, MIT has his robot called Cheetah, which is a four-leg electric robot. The fast-moving. Sorry? The Cheetah, the very fast-moving. Yeah. Yes. And I think we're going to see more and more legged robots eventually get into the home within the within 10 years or so. How, oh, 10 years? And how long until the AI gets there where it's uh, capable of, say, babysitting or dog sitting at least? Dog sitting, you don't have to do so much. I think that's going to be there. I, I think there is an AI bubble right now, and people are making a fundamental error on estimating how good AI is going to be, how quickly. It's undeniable that deep learning has had an tremendous unexpected impact. So that's why we have um, the Amazon Echo. It's why we have Google Home. That level of speech understanding was just not possible three to five years ago. Deep learning has had an impact. But I think what mistake people make is, especially people who are not working in AI directly, they see an AI system with a certain level of performance and if a person had that level of performance, it would be a natural way of generalizing what they could do to a competence around that. But that generalization doesn't happen with AI. So suppose, for instance, you saw someone sitting at a table with a stack of images. Do you know any language besides English? A little bit of Japanese. OK, so you, this is great. So you see someone picking up the pictures and writing in, in Japanese a little description of what's in the image. Now, AI systems can do that. You, if it's a person, you would expect that that person could certainly probably read Japanese if they're writing Japanese, you know, kanji uh, characters there. But the AI system can see the images, but it can't see Japanese characters. So you've gen overgeneralized its capabilities. Mm. And you'd think that probably you could talk to that person in Japanese about the weather, but the AI system that is labeling the images doesn't even know what weather is. Where, where is the bubble, where is that sense of the bubble in AI coming from? I mean, is this VCs don't do enough uh, due diligence of AI concepts, or why are you concerned about an AI bubble? I'm concerned about an AI bubble because I hear VCs telling me that certain problems should be easier. Just apply AI, and these are problems that I, I've Painting it on. Been work, yeah, you know, somehow it's like beer. You just pour some AI in and then it'll be magic. And I think AI has gotten, as Arthur C. Clarke said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And I think some VCs, some people in the press, some famous physicists uh, all don't understand what AI is doing. So we, to them, it's indistinguishable from magic. And once you've got magic, it can do anything and no technology can do anything. Technology proceeds, sudden, sometimes with sudden jumps that you don't expect, but it proceeds. It doesn't, it's, it doesn't just take over everything. Speaking of magic, I'm very curious uh, what robots captured your imagination as a kid. Oh, I was uh, 13, 13 years old? Is it 13? Yeah, 13 years old when um, 2001 A Space Odyssey came out. And how 
was this amazing, intelligent system. Admittedly, Hal was a murdering psychopath, yeah. but I loved Hal. I was just so impressed by Hal. And Hal didn't have a body, but of all the, all the 60s science fiction, actually, 2001 has held up best. You know, if you look at a Star Trek from the 60s, computers in 300 years were still things with big bezel lights, and if you ask it, what's the biggest prime number, smoke would pour out, whereas 2001 had graphic screens before there were any graphics. They did that by back projecting onto the screens and then re from film and refilming. I, I, I think 2001 was an amazing movie in, in, in terms of how it's held up on technology. And that's a sociopathic robot, right? I mean, or a computer anyway. How do we avoid committing human errors and repeating our own biases in robotic development? I think there is a danger that we, um, uh, in our learning systems, we select um, uh, uh, training sets which include bias. I think there's also a danger that people will abuse learning systems. We saw that with, what was that Microsoft uh, chatbot? Right. that soon got trained by the general public to say outrageous things. I think we'll see that if we start to see any, and I'm, I'm, I don't think it's going to happen as quickly as people think, but if we see truly driverless cars in areas where there are pedestrians, pedestrians are going to start taking advantage of them in all sorts of ways, and it's going to be much tougher to deploy self-driving cars than the current technologists think. Can you give me an example of what's yeah, going on? Yeah, so, so if, you, if, 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 if I live in Central Square in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and the roads are narrow, and I'm always making social contact with drivers about whether they're going to stop and whether I can walk in front, or people, if I'm a driver, sometimes people feel sorry for me that I've been waiting at a, at a pedestrian crossing for a long time, so they, they, they push me through. But there's certain obligations that I have as a driver to those pedestrians, and if I don't understand them, they're going to get mad at me, you know, they will yell at me, they will bash my car, and that's going to happen with the, the driverless cars. When there's no one in there for your, it's like, it's like flaming email and flaming posts, when there's no one in there to, you know, have a social judgment on you, you people will be much worse to take advantage. More jaywalking. More jaywalking, or just teasing the car by putting their foot out and, and stopping them while they're, while they're standing there talking to their friend. They'll make the car think they're going to step in front of it. I actually cannot wait to see that, just as a curiosity. By the way, there was a great tweet Chris Anderson put out a few weeks ago uh, of 3D Robotics. Uh, his tweet was just fantastic. He said, the passengers could tell they were in a driverless Uber because there were two human drivers rather than one which I think says a lot about where we are with driverless cars right now. Moving on to some business questions, do you think it's possible, you mentioned iRobots, um, the, the robots that decommission mines and do more serious work than sweeping up our dust. Um, is it possible now to have a robotic startup succeed, become profitable without some degree of a defense contract or a government contract for aerospace? Does that work now? Well, I hope so because my current company has not had any government contracts whatsoever. It's completely built on selling product to customers, to end customers, which are not military or government in any shape or form. Is Rethink profitable now? Uh, we're moving along. We, we, just, we just closed the Series E, so you can tell we're still raising money. But we're in rapid growth mode. When I speak with distributors in this space, or you know, just professionals uh, that are also selling automation equipment, um, they talk about how hard it is to get a factory to upgrade. How do you convince, you know, these machines are large, they're expensive, how, have you been encountering friction? How do you convince a company to yeah. try emerging technology like Yeah, this? manufacturing is an incredibly conservative business because they are measured on continuous output and, uh, and it's always a low margin business. So, you know, I've, I've joked that I would say we succeed if we can drag manufacturing into the late 20th century. That would be a fantastic uh, thing. So what we do is we look at We've looked, we've gone back again and again as we've brought out new versions of the product and looked what is the biggest friction that is stopping someone buying the robot and if they buy the robot, what is stopping, stopping them getting it deployed? Because often they buy it and then it sits there for months before they deploy it. Um, 
which traditional automation is how things work. I, I want to make it more like buying an iPhone. You wouldn't buy the iPhone and then not use it for three months. You would start, you start using it that day. Um, so what is, the, what is the current friction? The first friction was having to put safety cages around, so we made it safe to interact. Second friction was that industrial robots are all programmed in very old text-based languages from the mid-80s. Um, and so we got rid of that and just had people showing the robot what to do. The next thing that, that came up was connecting the robot to other automation equipment using PLCs, programmable logic controllers, which were developed in the 1960s to replace electromagnetic relays, but the fundamental unit of abstraction in the PLC is still the coil for a, a, a simulated electromagnetic relay. And so that was stopping people from connecting the robot to other automation equipment because they had to get in specialists to run the wires, to do the programming for that. Um, so in our latest version of our software, we've made the teach by demonstration for the robot also be able to control other uh, industrial equipment. So keep knocking down the friction. The current biggest friction is what sort of gripper do I put on the end of the, the, the robot for the particular task? That's still a great source of friction. How many people have Baxter and Sawyer displaced at work at this point? Uh, thousands. Do you tally that, really? Of course, yeah. This, of course... So, so you know, it, uh, and the, the more remote our supply chain gets in selling them, the harder it is to collect that data, but we really want to know. We want to know sell-through from our distributors. We want to know where they've gone. We want to know whether they've done an internal demo or whether they're actually deployed on the line because that's really important information for us to understand whether we're solving the need. So we, we really push our distributors to get us that information so that we have a hopefully a very up-to-date um, tally of how many robots are deployed. But then we, we find, you know, people send us photos, like there was one from somewhere in, in Thailand, a Baxter on a factory line. We don't sell it to Thailand. How did it get there? It's not certified to be in Thailand, does it? So, you know, there's a gray market, too, hmm. that goes on. I've got to ask because it was um, such a buzz in, in, within robotics, but Bill Gates suggested robots should be taxed to help make up for some of the payroll taxes lost when you don't have to hire as many workers uh, for some of the income tax. Do you think that's a good idea? Yeah, I think that makes an assumption that these robots are um, displacing people. My experience has been that people cannot get enough labor for factories in the US or in China or in Japan. Uh, mostly because of the aging demographics. Hmm. And so I think that's misguided. Um, uh, you know, should we... I, I'm not sure he would have liked taxes on, on, uh, on uh, uh, windows because it was displacing editors or something. Typists. <laughs> no, typists, yes. Is there a job that you think robots should never do? Uh, not a priori. Uh, the, often people... Here's, this might be controversial. Um, a, a, a lot of people say we shouldn't have robots making firing decisions in the military where they pull the trigger. Um, I, I, we thought about that a lot at iRobot, and we came to the conclusion, although we, iRobot has not sold any robots to do this, that a robot can afford to fire second. If you're sending an 18 or 19-year-old kid, which is what the U.S. does, straight out of high school, putting them in a high-stress situation in a country where they don't speak the language at night and they go in somewhere and they think they're getting shot at, they shoot back. A robot doesn't have to shoot back. So I think, you know, there's an example where one version of we should never allow a robot to have control of, of weapons, but they're going to be, they can be much more cautious than an 18-year-old kid is going to be. So, so I think just about anything you come up with, you can probably find arguments both ways. They're never easy. There are robotic reporters, you know, doing sports writing, and I, I think about it in light of my own career. Um, well, let me, let me say, every time I get into an Uber or a Lyft, I tell the driver, your job is safe. Because I don't think we're going to have self-driving cars for a long, long time. How despite long? Despite what, what tech says. We're going to start having partition spaces in our cities where we do have self-driving 
first in parking garages, then certain lanes, um, but we won't have a mixing between pedestrians and self-driving cars for a long, long time. And I think we won't have much mixing between self-driving cars and human-driven cars for a long time. I think we're going to do it via partition. And that is going to disappoint all the Silicon Valley wanna, you know, people. But, uh, oh, you're, you live out there, don't you? Yeah, OK. Um, I'm from St. Louis originally. It's OK. OK. Thank you so much. I'm afraid we're out of time. I could keep you here all day, but they won't let me. OK, well, thank, thank you. you. Really Thanks to it. all of you. Thank you.